thanks for having us. So I like to do these a little bit different than a lot of them. And the reason is this whole conference is about bringing people together, yep. right? And as I think about you as a marketer amongst your peers, I want to try and learn stuff about you mm -hmm. more than just talk about HP. OK, that's good. So let's start there. Let's start with the basics and say, um, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, but let's start with where you're from, that amazing accent. So, I mean, we could do a quiz in the room, but uh, I come from France. <laughs> uh, I moved to the U.S. in San Francisco 12 years ago. And uh, that was just like following my partner at that time. And uh, there was no long-term plan. And we essentially set, set up a family. And, uh, and, yeah, uh, yeah, it's now home. Yeah, now it's, uh, San Francisco is home. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And then... You know, we talk about work here. So what was your very first job, like high school, college, whatever? What was the first thing you ever did? So I never worked until I was maybe 18 or 19. Like, to be honest, never done that. It's uh, also in the, in, in the culture, I will say. There was not uh, as much of opportunity to get paid on, you know, a little job. But uh, my first job was uh, where I got paid was a uh, dog walker, dog sitter. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many dogs did you like tote around town? Um, just one of time. I, it was not a thing before. You, it's yeah. Just now like, we're guys got like, like ten yeah. dogs running. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. I have high re respect for those people, but I'm not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Did you learn anything out of that experience uh, that you like yeah. apply in your professional life now? Yeah, I try to think about that question. I was like, ah, no, I don't think. But uh, uh, accountability was one, I guess, because you're responsible of. Um, a living creator, so you definitely just put me in a spot where I have to be, you know, responsible. Uh, yeah, for a first job, that's important. First job, you yeah. got to be responsible, not mm -hmm. kill somebody's loving family yeah. member. Or, right. or lose him. Or lose and I did. That would I did happen to lose one. And, uh, but he found his way home in Paris. I have no idea how he made that, but uh, <laughs> that happened. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> as long as it found its way home, then that's OK. That's but I became way more accountable since then. Okay. Yeah, good. <laughs> HP, they're not gonna, you're not gonna lose any of their money. It's gonna be okay. Yeah. That's okay. Right. Good. Um, well, that's awesome. My first first job was actually cleaning furniture in a furniture store. Doesn't okay. it all apply to this world? But again, detail oriented. <laughs> you didn't want to have dust on the furniture. That was not gonna work out so well. Um, so uh, you got your first gig, dog walking. Went to school. Mm -hmm. Did you study marketing and advertising? Yeah, I study um, economics and marketing uh, in La Sorbonne in Paris. And, uh, and then I did a few internships, ended up uh, having my first job on the publication side, uh, big media house and on, on the research team. And quickly, like with connection, I found a, an a media, independent media agency that was starting to grow. And I, I joined them and I spent seven years in the company before quitting my job and moving to the oh, US. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like as your first agency job. That's yeah. a pretty, pretty long tenure. Yeah. Um, what brought you into media? Like what was the, what was the draw for you? Perks, right? Um, just, um, I mean, I was interested in uh, econometrics and advertising, but I just wanted a job. Um, <laughs> and I had a very good connection with this person. I think I had more appeal with the people at that media agency because it was, a small media boutique would you would do everything. Uh, they won't treat me like badly at all, but they were like strong leaders, and so I had to do everything from a media perspective and also, you know, it was a small apartment. It was not a big office, so we have to take care of our stuff. So we, we, we were like a little family, and we grow all together. And, uh, and uh, so it's more the experience and, I mean, an appeal for media and advertising and uh, some of the skills required for that, also something natural for me. But it was never, I never woke up when I was 10 to say, I'm going to be an advertiser. Yeah, me either. Never. Mm -hmm. No chance. And I, I was... I, I'm not sure how many people know, I still understand what I'm doing for a living. Uh, even still. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> even still. Yeah, I still can't convince my parents that I actually have a job. It's like, <laughs> they don't get it. Um, maybe if they see this, they will then know what I do. Um, 
So, the, you know, background in agency, uh, lived the agency life for a long time, both states and uh, internationally. Mm -hmm. um, and then you ended up in a really unique role. The in-housing just came up in the last talk. And so tell us about your role now with HP. Yeah, so I joined HP after four years at UM here in San Francisco and my first job on the client side. And um, it's we launched our in-house agency in 2019. And so um, I can give a bit of background on how that, that happened, but right now in my role at ZG, which is the name of the in-house agency, we actually have a name, uh, which means um, something about inner self or oneself in uh, Chinese Mandarin. So, um, but I didn't pick up the name, but that's uh, that was the name. And so, in the way we operate, there's like a planning and strategy team, and there's an activation team, measurement team. All on the ZG, we all collaborate together, like we will do in the agency side. And uh, I'm leading strategy and planning uh, for North America. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because a lot of times people talk about in-housing and we've heard, we've all seen agencies created or left and then somebody builds their own in-house agency and they fail. And so I think what's really interesting about our, st our conversation was that, you know, four years is a pretty good run with three and a half, whatever, uh, is a pretty good run to be successfully managing your, your media. And so like the structure I think is super interesting. So as people think about what does this look like to me or someone's just doing it for the first time, um, can you share a little bit about like what you credit the success to be? Yeah. Um, so for the background, I will say that mm, all of a sudden there's more sound. Um, uh, the the thought about bringing this discipline in house uh, started when uh, HP uh, split off from sister company HP. Uh, that's when I joined the company. So I had no history about this, but it was certainly a huge not mess. Not mess is not the world, but there was a lot of reorganization going on, a lot of different business lines. So with that, an opportunity for um, kind of uh, uh, re uh, reorganize, uh, consolidate some of those uh, business line, product line, from a media standpoint specifically. I feel at that point, though, so PhD was our agency of record, still is because we have, uh, I'll talk more about this, but we still uh, 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 partner with PhD. Um, and PhD was managing like maybe 50 plus campaign per quarter. So they were like just executing, 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 executing. So there's been, it took some years to build in and figure out that there's, there's things that we could streamline. Um, so from a strategic standpoint, but also from an execution, execution standpoint. And so, um, uh, we we thought about like what will be the right model for that, and eventually uh, ZG came to life uh, in 2019. The f the pillar around the model, I think, and that's one of the success I think of the, of uh, of, uh, of this is it's it's very based on tighter collaboration with all the groups. So at that point, the center of excellence, which was the media team, was connecting and doing this lesion with marketing, data science, and all of that. And so we became a bit more you know, nimble on the way of working. So tighter collaboration, transparency on the data, like we had to get media and data closer. Um, agility, obviously. So we needed to have, we wanted to bring s some friction out of the system and and you know, streamline some of those things that we could do it ourselves. Keep the keep the thing that PhD was the only one to really help us, or outside agency really help us do. So tighter collaboration, agility, transparency, and ultimately performance. And so that's the second thing that I would say was key to our success is that as soon as we started, we took some pilots and we run like five campaigns. So with that, we demonstrate like higher performance and we immediately have use case to get the full support from the marketing team. Yeah, where it's no longer like we're trying to sell in this transformation of our organization. It's like, here, we, we did yeah, this and we it, did it yeah. has results. Yeah. Because they are used support. I mean, without the funding or anything like this, we will have nothing. So 
we had like uh, full support from the marketing and I think that was uh, definitely a good success. We had great talents in the team. Um, we had somebody who came in and helped us hire a bunch of folks in San Diego. So quickly our US team grew in San Diego and then we became uh, a team of 100 or a bit more than I mean, 110, 120. I'm not counting anymore globally. Yeah, that's a big media team for your you know, organization. For an organization, yeah. As an yeah. agency, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I think the PhD relationship is, is unique. I think that's a, a cool thing that you guys have. And so today, when you think about that, like just for transparency's sake, how do you, how do you designate? How, how do you decide who's doing what? Yeah. Uh, so it's an hybrid model. So essentially by taking out all the activation stuff, of the like some of the some of the friction in the system, I think the best way to this world, but all the performance driven campaign that we have that we could manage in house, we kept PhD focus on the things they do better, like the, the buying power, the strategic uh, perspective uh, of the marketplace. Um, so they, they are still huge partner for that. They still manage our offline. Uh, uh, media, which is not huge in the US, uh, mostly in, uh, more in Europe. Um, so we, we find this balance of actually, I mean, the team working at PhD were doing way more interesting work from, uh, from that. And they were the one pulling us, like, some, no, sometimes they're the ones just like giving us the step back that we needed. When it used to be us asking them to take that step back from all the activation and think straight on the strategy before they go hand in hand. Yeah, and I think that's a huge piece of it, right? Especially as our industry is always evolving, do you want your partner to be the person that's like, hey, can you give me this? Can you give me this? Can you give me this? Yeah. Or the one that's the slave, yeah. proactively bringing it to you? Yeah. We're the in-house slave now, so it's, it's uh, different. Like yeah, yeah, exactly. Are. You're like, I, we have to do all the work now. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. Um, <laughs> And the other thing that was super interesting in our talk, when you think about that proactive part, mm. our industry's changing really rapidly, always like have something new, shiny object or otherwise. Cookie list just came up and you know, marketers are in different stages in terms of where they are, how they feel. Can you talk to us about how this kind of discipline that you've built yeah. enables you to be more proactive and, and some of the stuff you guys have already done practically so that people can Learn from that? Yeah. Uh, so on the cookie list, I mean, this has been um, on our radar for a while. And we raised, first raised the death of the cookie. I remember that slide that uh, our global asked me to pull and share with the marketing people. Uh, so cookie in a way. And what was essentially the implication on measurement and targeting. And two years back, I think everybody will relate. It was all about hyper-targeting, the tailor the message to this one person and eventually and it's it took us like three years to like prior to that it took us so much time to get the marketing like you know observe programmatic and how flexible and in uh, agile we could be and and uh, hyper targeting and as they were just like finally enjoying it and building plan around it we're like no sorry <laughs> Yeah, they're like, oh, okay, we, we get this. We want to do this a lot. And now you're like, no, 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 no we can't can. do that anymore. No. If you need to talk to that person, I can just knock on his door at that point. That will be more precise. So we, we raised the issue, uh, and we immediately took some action. And I think it took us one year to remove our third party uh, in our plan. And we also uh, build our own research. We partner with uh, Melbourne uh, Business School and uh, MIT to develop this uh, research to, to uh, audit uh, um, B2B uh, data and um, uh, uh, going after ITDM. And, and essentially, we, we validate some of the things that we we're already reading. But it was a HP use case. So that's why it was more compelling for us and we had more power to change things in the organization, showing that uh, using cookie-based uh, targeting was just um, most of the time inaccurate, and we will actually be more on, uh, on targets if we just apply a demo targeting. So, with those, like that's the thing. We built our own use case, and I feel ultimately there was no way we could, like the people could, uh, like uh, shy away from that, and so. Um, now, cookie less means like, where do we go about our targeting? And so, in our strategy, we built some uh, um, some principle how we could go after an audience. So we need to understand 
you know, who are those people, what are the things we know from an insights perspective that we can address in media. Um, I heard uh, earlier on the, on the meeting that, you know, it's also finding like a, those territory or passion points uh, where you can rally people around. Um, so it's about not don't go too too broad because you will lose uh, effectiveness, but don't go too narrow because you will lose efficiency. So there's a uh, there's this right balance, and you know we are testing uh, new UI ID, uh, all the Google targeting capabilities. So we are always testing those uh, things, but we pretty much live in the line of our data other people's first party that are contextual. I mean, we're going back to uh, the way we used to, a little bit of how we used to plan uh, uh, a few years back. Yeah, I think that's, you know, the industry changes so quickly and there's always new stuff, but the reality is we're kind of going back to the beginning of yeah. what really matters in comms planning. What really matters in your consumer activations and strategies, what is, what's your goal? And so that was the other thing I really enjoyed about our conversation because Pad Squad's a creative media company. We care a lot, we care very deeply about creative, and creative is a part of something you guys are thinking about. So you can you talk about like your approach to comms planning and, and what that overall looks like. So uh, we think about creative when we're in the stage of um, building the comms plan. So it's. Um, once we have a goal, we have an audience, and hopefully, like everybody's aligned on that goal and that audience, then we can think about the role of a uh, channel for the specific, uh, uh, a specific um, uh, objective, and then from there we build a strategy. Um, we 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 lean a lot on um, attention metrics now. It's something that has been embedded in our comms framework. It's still something that we are. Uh, testing from a activation standpoint, or still doing vendors some vendors and all that good yeah, stuff. Yeah, and also like validating the the, the relation between uh, attention unit and our um, standard KPI like viewability. So there's a bit of that vetting, but from a planning standpoint, uh, and the comms and identifying the 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 role of channel, and then you think about more than reaching the audience, like what's going to be the experience that you want to get out of the creative, uh, uh, we think about those things as well. And um, there's things, our, our, our primary is like, where are we going to show in which place and make sure we, 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 uh, we hit on the goals? Where are we going to place the creative we're getting from the creative agency? But then eventually is how can we even further like engage with this audience? And so that's where we lean on the custom. Um, Aspect will like we'll make a case for custom if we feel like the creative is kind of mm, might not, not quite there not, yet. not yeah. quite there or we'll deliver on on the wellness and some key points but if we have a goal of demonstrating the a specific future of a product or something like this we'll have to find a, a way to be a bit more engaging and get those those people to uh, you know um, be interested to want to learn more. Yeah, no, that's that's super helpful. Just because today, I mean, we've heard a lot of people talk about creative. Yeah. And uh, many times when the topic of the conference is media, the last thing I think that media folks are really going to be talking about is creative. And so it's it's wonderful to see that kind of blend and how important it is and how important it will be in the long term. Um, and so, like, this is a funny story. It's kind of embarrassing. But we were we had our kickoff call and we're talking and she's like, oh, there's this really cool Pad Squad thing we submitted for an award uh, with the drum. I was like, wait, what? Like, no, I didn't no, you were not there. Like, you were like, yeah, yeah, I know. Yes. Yeah, we, the really was like, what? And um, uh, so like in terms of talking about that, we can use that campaign as kind of like a little illustration of really how that kind of worked and, and why you thought it was award worthy and interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I what I like about this use case, is it, it does check the box on how I like to approach planning with my team, which is, you know, we set up some, you know, like commit, commit, uh, commandments or tenets in the way we work, where it's like, you know, make sure to be single-minded when you set up primary uh, objectives so we don't uh, optimize to meaningless metrics, um, understand your audience, um, and then leverage learning, historical learnings. Like, too often we do stuff and then we're happy about it, or we're not, or we don't know, and we just move on. So in this case, it was, our last back to school campaign. Um, and 
the goal was driving consideration and preference for our product and uh, our line of product is was the premium one and there was a specific um, future like um, um, like a privacy screen thing that we wanted to showcase in it um, and so and the goal like the the audience was the gen z so the question came okay so how do we break through with this audience that spend this time on on mobile that don't interact with our ad and um, you know we're gonna have to compete with the million of ads they're gonna see so when we thought about the mobile strategy I mean essentially we had the core of our campaign was you know video led and making sure we're building reach uh, and the right uh, efficient reach, uh, frequency but we found a pocket of you know a pocket of our strategy was about driving engagement and on the mobile space, we had learnings from Pasquad and other platform <laughs> partner uh, that high impact unit will, you know, help move the needle on brand metrics and engagement. And, but it was not perfect, so we we did it again, but just uh, with more more uh, more learning from the previous uh, route, and we create this very simple, simple, immersive experience where people will just quickly understand what's the future of that product and an opportunity for them to learn more. It, as it's, so it's not like, I will say the outcome, the creative is not how, like how brilliant, it, it's nice, um, it's seamless, but it's mostly like how, like it was a nice use case to put together because it was just like checking the box of everything was aligned and then eventually drive very high, very, very nice uh, performance from, you know, time spent with the ads and also, uh, so from an attention standpoint, like people mm. were spending like, you know, six times more time with this uh, ad than a regular uh, banner and and uh, on the back end also nice impact on the brand perception. Yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, that idea that high impact creative has to be crazy or has to be different or difficult, like I know this proves the point that it's not necessarily that. Um, but. Thank you for sharing that story. Like, again, I don't really have it. And I love the Ten Commandments. You money, no. Yeah, I do owe you money. Um, cocktail, perhaps. Um, but the Ten Commandments thing is something I like. I want to can you give that to me. I'm going to like sell it off <laughs> to other teams. Um, but we're coming to the close. We're like about to wrap up. So I like to do, because we're primarily mobile, I like to like kind of try and embarrass you. Yeah. So can you get your phone? Yeah. So this is like getting to know your uh, peers. Okay. So, so I he didn't give me any insight into what he was going, and I'm completely freaking out about this one. <laughs> it's painless, mostly. Okay, well, tell me. Okay, so go to your phone. Yeah, I'm on my phone. Uh, like on the phone, the dialer, like your your, your oh, call like history. On actual phone. Okay. Uh, who was the last person you talked to for more than five minutes? So how would you see that? Yeah, it's like a little time <laughs> thing down there. Okay, yeah, you don't have it, actually. No, 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 Damn, no, Apple phones. I can tell you what. All right, just, yeah, who do you think you last talked to for more than five minutes? Uh, my partner, obviously, oh, okay. yeah. Your partner, okay. Yeah. I'm not going to ask you what you talked about and all that good mm, stuff. Uh, what we argue about. <laughs> 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 what you argued about. That's over cocktails, that for sure. A, that was a very long one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then that's easy. Uh, so the next one is um, your camera roll. Oh, gosh. What's the last <laughs> thing you took a camera, okay, hold on, a picture hold on. of? Somebody back there was like, don't ask about my camera roll. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's the last one I have is uh, oh, that's really uh, cute. friends uh, having fun in Spain. So That's amazing. Yeah. I love it. I was not there, so it's well, nice. That part sucks. <laughs> that part sucks. <laughs> um, and then the, uh, I'll, I have two more. Okay. The, the <laughs> next one is, what do you use to listen to music on your phone? What kind of music? Like what, what app do you use to listen oh, to music? Oh, Spotify. Okay, can you so open Spotify? Spotify, yeah, okay. <laughs> it could get really embarrassing. <laughs> uh, so what's the last song you had playing? Uh, the last album is Pomme. It's a French singer. You don't know her, so you cannot go after me. <laughs> and then that it's... Can't it's, judge her musical uh, taste on and that one. And it's Sing too because I have kids. And Sing then, 2 is so cute, by the way, if you guys haven't seen it, it's really yeah, cute. Yeah, it's cute. Um, okay, last one. Okay. Social media channel, oh, which sure. one do you use most uh, frequently? Most Instagram, I will say. Ah, yeah. okay. Can you see what you posted last? I, I don't post, I just ah. stare at people. How about I where do you like post? People. Stalker. No, no, no I, n I never. You don't I post, never post. you don't post anywhere. No, no, I never post. 
Well, I there you go. Like, she, the, your secrets the... are all safe with her. She's not <laughs> telling anybody anything. No, thank you so much for the time. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And letting thank us get fun. to know you. And now people can ask you questions uh, okay. based on your experience. All right. I'm ready. Thank you. It's finished. Yeah. Do you have, does anyone have any questions? Or you want to talk over cocktails and dinner? Like, either way. Solid. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.